Welcome to those who might be joining us online and welcome to those people who are in the room today. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to be welcoming people to the virtual IAS as well as to the um, in-person IAS today for what um, I'm sure is going to prove to be a really exciting and interesting um, seminar. And, um, and I don't know if we can call it a book launch exactly, but a book talk um, uh, around uh, um, our IAS visiting fellow Melanie O'Brien's um, uh, new volume, which you can see if you've just tuned in on screen. Um, if for those of you who are joining us online, if I could just point you to the fact that there is a um, uh, a button on the bottom of your screen for a chat, and there is also one for a Q and A. We'll monitor both of those if anyone um, online has any comments or questions, and we'll make sure they come into the conversation at the end. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to um, turn over to my colleague Roman Lee, who is uh, at Loughborough in London, um, who is really hosting this visit and. Um, and and uh, working uh, quite closely with Melanie, who is going to do a brief introduction and also introduce um, how the session will run today. So we are delighted to see you here at the IAS, Melanie, and Ronan, it's over to you. Fantastic. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, for those that are joining us online, we're obviously located in uh, International House, the home of the Institute for Advanced Studies here at Loughborough University. Um, wonderful that, that Mel is here today. Uh, the order of play will be that um, we'll introduce Mel, I'll introduce Mel in a moment, and uh, she'll present uh, her book. We'll make sure that there's plenty of opportunity for questions. Uh, in, in terms of ensuring that there's opportunities for, for early career people, we'll, we'll take questions in, in uh, order of reverse seniority, I think would be a, a sensible approach, so the professors can wait till the end. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that Loughborough University and the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, has a chance to hear from uh, Dr. Melanie O'Brien, a world leading scholar of genocide, human rights and law. Um, Dr. O'Brien is an Associate Professor of International Law at the University of Western Australia in Perth. Uh, she's the President of the International Association of Genocide Scholars and today she's a fellow, she's a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, Mel's work on forced marriage has been cited by the International Criminal Court, and she's before she appeared before the ICC uh, as an expert consultant. Uh, very important to add, Dr. O'Brien is the author of *Criminalizing Peacekeepers: Modernizing National Approaches to Sexual Exploitation and Abuse*. And the book we'll hear about today, *From Discrimination to Death: Genocide Process Through a Human Rights Lens*. Through a human rights lens, was recently published by Ravage. Um, this book studied the processes of genocide through the human rights violations that occur during genocide. Dr. O'Brien uses individual testimonies and in depth multi country, multi, multi -country field research from the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust, and the Cambodian genocide. The book demonstrates that a pattern of specific escalating human rights abuses takes place throughout genocide. It offers an analysis of all of these particular human of, of these particular human rights and how they are uh, human rights, I should say, and how they are violated throughout the genocide process. And Dr. O'Brien outlines how genocide and regimes of human rights law correlate. Um, Dr. O'Brien applies the pattern of rights violations to the Rohingya genocide, revealing that this pattern could have been used to prevent the violence against the Rohingya community. Uh, Dr. O'Brien obviously advocates for a greater role for human rights oversight bodies in genocide prevention, and it's my absolute delight to uh, ask Dr. O'Brien to present her book to us today. Thank you, thank you so much um, to everyone. I really appreciate the welcome from the Institute of Advanced Studies, um, the, the wonderful warm welcome that I've had and also really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be a visiting fellow here at Loughborough Uni um, for the, the time that I'm here in the UK. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my book. It's obviously very difficult to distill a whole book into a 40-minute talk, um, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so 
what I'm going to do is I'm sort of going to give a, a little bit of an overview um, and then I'm going to take some examples out of the book um, and walk through those. I'm hoping I can get through two examples, but we may only get through one um, depending on, on how time goes today. So bear with me on that. So I wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country. We always do these in Australia and I know I'm not on country right now, but I do always still like to do it because I obviously do the majority of my work on Wajak Noongar country and would like to acknowledge that and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging on the country where I am normally based. Um, so this is my book. I have a little uh, discount code there uh, for anyone who would like to buy a copy um, or encourage their library to buy a copy as well. <laughs> Um, so it's called From Discrimination to Death, Genocide Process Through a Human Rights Lens. So to give you a bit of an overview about the book, essentially why I decided to move to, to work into this area was that I wanted to incorporate human rights, human rights law into genocide scholarship because I noticed there was an absence of that. The two terms are used quite often together, genocide and human rights, but without really engaging in human rights. So I wanted to fill a gap that existed in the genocide studies scholarship. And that was why I, I started on this project to explore, you know, what is the connection between genocide and human rights? Because for example, the genocide convention is often referred to as a human rights treaty, but it is in fact not a human rights treaty. It is a crime suppression treaty. So in fact, the genocide convention isn't part of the human rights law system. It sits apart from that. So I wanted to have a look at, well, what is the relationship? How can we see a connection between the concept of genocide and actually what, what is the human rights law system? So what I started off with is this concept of genocide as a process, which is how genocide scholars see genocide. We don't see it as an event. We don't see it as a one-off. We see it as a process. And a number of different scholars have written their own theories about how that process works um, and, and how many stages it has. Um, you know, Helen Fine, for example, initially um, looked at the process but was focused only on the Holocaust, for example, um, early on. Helen Fine was also um, a scholar who, who actually did incorporate human rights into her work. Um, and she has sadly passed away last year. So this idea of genocide as a process is, is an accepted one, but I wanted to look at the process from a human rights angle. So I decided to look at three historical case studies to see, is there a particular pattern of human rights violations that take place in the genocide process? And does that, is that pattern consistent between different genocides? So I selected the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust and the Cambodian genocide. So all 20th century genocides, but at different periods of time um, and in different locations. So I wanted to see whether there was a pattern there and is there a pattern between all three as well that we could put together and use. And I'm gonna explain the pattern um, in, a, in a little bit. So I use the three historical case studies throughout the book, but at the end, I have a chapter where I look at the Rohingya genocide and I apply that pattern to see, did it apply to that? And could we have used this pattern to prevent the Rohingya genocide? So I'm saying prevent genocide. Essentially, there's a couple of ideas behind creating this pattern or paradigm that I did find um, in, in the genocide processes here. And the first one is to contribute to genocide prevention. So if we can see a pattern of conduct, we can say we are in the genocide process and so therefore we need to act. And a lot of prevention literature talks about early warning, um, early warning prevention measures. So mine is more what I call midstream prevention because if you start in the early stages that I'm talking about, I mean, there are plenty of, of countries where you have, for example, discrimination, but it's certainly not going to lead to genocide. But with my pattern, if you get about halfway through approximately this process, you can see actually there's a specific pattern of human rights violations that are taking place. So we are in the genocide process. And I'm using that, that expression quite specifically, rather than saying, we are 
uh, at risk of genocide, I'm saying we're already in the genocide process. And that argument comes from the fact that genocide is not just the killing that happens at the end of the process. It is actually all of the other things that take place. And that's why it's a process and not an event. And so that's why I'm saying this is midstream prevention. It's not all early warning kind of thing. It is definitely midstream because we're already in the process. And, and But that's where the alarm is going off. It's telling you actually we're there already. Um, connected to that, I'm hoping that this book will contribute to prosecution and of, of perpetrators of genocide and conviction. So I'm hoping that it will help lawyers when they're making an argument as to whether particular conduct was genocide. So if it does fit this pattern, they can argue that, they can then say it can help them because genocide is, is notoriously difficult to prove, um, it, especially because of the required, what we call in law, dollar specialis or the special intent, which is the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. And that special intent can be very difficult to prove. So I'm hoping that this pattern, if this pattern fits the particular genocide that prosecutors are working on, that they can then use that as, as part of their argument to say, actually, yes, look, it fits this pattern. So I do wanna make clear that I'm not saying that every single genocide will fit this pattern, but I'm saying that if something fits this pattern, we can argue that it is genocide. And so I'm hoping that also that will assist obviously judges who are making decisions about whether or not something was genocide, which is again, as difficult for the judges as it is for the prosecutors. So hopefully uh, that will be part of it. So I've got a lot of photos in my presentation today um, and unless otherwise indicated, they're all photos that I have taken um, in my field work in different places. Uh, the photos on the screen now are photos um, at the end of 2019, my last pre-COVID <laughs> work trip, I was in, um, in the refugee, Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. And so these were taken there. So I mentioned a pattern, and obviously this is the key part of my book. So I just wanted to show you what is the pattern that I'm talking about. Um, I've divided it into five parts because essentially I think those are the, the grouping components of the genocide process. And I think that once we get to part two, the end of part two, we can essentially really see that we're in the genocide process, but particularly once we're in part three as well. So we don't need to get to part four where we're looking at things like torture and killing before we know that genocide is taking place. And the reason that I'm arguing this is because you actually can't get to the end of the process without all of those stages beforehand. So perpetrators of genocide have to go through all of these initial stages in order to essentially create an atmosphere of acceptance for the killing of the targeted group. And they can't do that without all of these previous steps. So those are part of the process. My book is structured that each chapter looks at a right or a group of rights and talks about what are the parameters of that right or those rights. And it then looks at each of the case studies to see how were those rights violated in that particular genocide. At the end of the chapter, I will also, I also talk about where does this conduct fit into genocide crimes? So this is again, my argument that genocide isn't just killing, and that when prosecutors are prosecuting genocide, obviously they will prosecute the, the killing part of it, but they can also prosecute this other conduct as well. So often much of it falls into the um, causing serious or uh, bodily or mental harm, but some of them fit within other categories of genocide crimes. So this is the pattern that I found. So we, I'm not gonna go through all of them in depth because uh, that would take a really long time, but just an overview. Um, and then we're gonna have a look at a couple of them in depth. Um, so I started with uh, freedom from discrimination, which you know I consider to be an umbrella right that all of the other ones fall under. And I don't wanna say that this is a step-by-step process, you know, in terms of you have discrimination and then you have violation of freedom of expression and opinion, and then you have violation of rights to education. So they, these do overlap. It's more an approximate temporal order. And for example, obviously we have discrimination is committed throughout the entire genocide process. 
So it starts with that, but that also goes all the way through. So uh, we start with discrimination where the targeted group is, is obviously discriminated against through many different ways. And, and actually all of the other uh, rights that you see there are, are violated through discrimination as well. Um, freedom of expression opinion is a really interesting one. Um, and, and I'm not gonna talk about that today, but I do do another talk on that. And um, uh, because it was one of the most interesting ones, I will just tell you that it was the one different right. So when I'm looking at the violations of human rights, I'm talking about the rights of the targeted group, of the victims. But freedom of expression and opinion actually also violates the rights of the majority group, which is very interesting because it's focused on um, it's focused on propaganda, it's focused on control of the media, and so therefore it is controlling uh, freedom of expression and opinion of the entire population. And, and that is actually really, really essential in the process because it's about changing the opinions of the majority people so that they see the targeted group as an enemy group that needs to be ultimately annihilated. Um, right to education and cultural rights. This is where the targeted group is essentially excluded from education, um, it, tertiary, primary, uh, secondary education, um, and also their cultural rights are taken away. Um, I look at another chapter at religion in particular because it is a particular focus of culture. It is a very um, it, it is a very obvious manifestation of culture and so is often targeted by genocide perpetrators, even if the target group is not targeted as a religious group. Um, so it's quite an important step in the process um, and it is connected to cultural rights. Um, so that other cultural rights are things like, you know, for example, in the Holocaust, um, Jews were banned from going to the cinema. So there's all sorts of things that seem really small, but if you can imagine what it would be like in your daily life that someone said, well, you can't go to the cinema and you can't shop in a particular shop. So it, it's something that really changes the way that the target group um, is able to live their life. Employment, fair trial, association and public service rights. So these are quite connected as well, you know, particularly employment and public service. Often the target group is banned from um, having jobs in the public service in the country as a starting point. Um, and then further on, their own uh, ability to work in different professions is affected as well. Um, fair trial rights, this is about essentially how the target group ends up being treated within the legal system and their access to the law, which um, becomes curtailed and then can be quite extreme in the way they're treated in the legal system. Um, religion, I've, I've already mentioned. Uh, the rights of family and privacy uh, and, and child rights are, are connected, but I've separated them because child rights are very specific. There's a specific convention on the rights of the child. And although these have an overlap, because obviously children have a right to family, there are also specific child rights that I look at in the book. So for example, the right to play, the right to rest, play and leisure, which I found to be a really interesting one, which of course is very much taken away from children you know, during the genocide process. So that's part two. And essentially, you know, this is, once we've seen these types of things happening, we could actually take action um, to prevent genocide and prevent it escalating to the next sections, which is where we start to see a much more physical manifestation of the violence um, on, the, on the bodies of the people in the targeted group. So in part three, I look at freedom of movement, right to liberty and security of person and freedom from slavery. So this is where people are restricted from moving, um, around places where they live um, and even obviously to the extent of then being put in places like ghettos or camps so they can't move anywhere. This is also where we see forced labour and slavery coming into play. Um, so that is, you know, significant connections here. Uh, we're then leading to issues on the right to health and the right to adequate standard of living. I'm going to talk more about the right to adequate standard of living today. That's what I'm going to focus on because it's, it's an interesting one and it's a little bit different. And I think people don't necessarily know that much about it, but the adequate standard of living includes food, clothing and housing. So I'm going to talk about housing today and I hope clothing if we have enough time, but we'll see. So the right to health is obviously violated at this point because people are in conditions where they uh, their health is at risk, but also often they no longer really have 
necessarily have access to healthcare um, medicines and that kind of thing. Um, we then progress into the extreme ends uh, of, of where we start to see um, behaviour like torture taking place and, of course, the killings uh, that are such an integral part of destroying a group. Now, my part five uh, is, is quite a different one. And I've, I've said refugee rights, but actually in the book, I call it the refugee stage. I'm not talking about the rights in the refugee convention, but I'm just talking about how refugees in general experience human rights when they are a refugee. And essentially my argument is that the refugee stage is also part of the genocide process because how they experience their rights is, is actually, there's a lot of the similar things. So for example, the right to health is a significant one. You know, refugees have often traveled usually by foot very, very long distances. They arrive in refugee camps. They are, their, their health is already compromised. Um, when we have huge numbers, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people arriving in a refugee camp, the healthcare, even with the best efforts of the international community, obviously, especially in the first weeks and months, is, is the healthcare provisions and the food provisions are insufficient. So I look at a whole lot of different experiences of refugees to say, actually, I believe this is part of the genocide process and that... Um, that the perpetrators of the genocide in their original country should still be held accountable for what for the for what these refugees experience when they are refugees. So when they have um, issues with health, when they have illness, and actually death as well. Um, so that's something in the book that is quite a unique argument. Um, but essentially, my study what it also demonstrates is that all of the rights violations covered in genocide are interrelated. So without first discriminating, without taking away freedom of expression, cultural rights, education, and so on, ultimately a genocidal regime cannot carry out the physical destruction of the group. So I'll give you a couple of examples. You start with employment rights where you say people can't work in the public service, people can't work as lawyers, people can't work as university lecturers, and ultimately you progress to slavery and forced labour. So they don't jump straight into slavery and forced labor because it would be too extreme a step. But to get there, we say, well, you know, for example, we don't want Jews working in universities. Um, we don't want Armenians working in the public service. So by creating that atmosphere, you can eventually come to a place where it's acceptable, socially acceptable with the majority group that you have these targeted groups in forced labor and slavery uh, situation. Employment rights are also connected to adequate standard of living because if you don't have a job, you don't have any money and you can't put a roof over your head or food on your table. So there is a direct correlation there between these. Another example is this, uh, this concept of the adequate standard of living and health uh, and in human and degrading treatment um, and also actually the right to life. So... Um, Essentially, what we're seeing here is that um, basically, if you don't have a roof over your head, if you don't have clothing, if you don't have food, and if you are unwell, that is essentially inhuman and degrading treatment. And it can also lead to the violation of the right to life because you can die from illnesses. You can die from exposure. And which is quite common in genocide, whether it's cold weather or hot weather. So all of the rights that I talk, these are just examples, but they're all interconnected and essential to the process. So I wanted to go into a little bit of detail about housing. I'm going to start with housing and hopefully if, if we have time, I'll, I'll get to clothing as well, um, to talk about why housing is so important, but really the role that the violation of the right to adequate housing plays in genocide. So these are images from the Armenian genocide, but I wanted to talk to you a bit first about uh, the right to housing itself. So the right to housing is connected with human dignity. Um, and the fact is that this right is the right to adequate housing. So not just housing. So that means it's not just about a roof over your head. Um, and the economic and social, economic, social and cultural rights committee 
has declared that the right to housing should not be interpreted in a narrow or restrictive sense, which equates it with, for example, the shelter provided by merely having a roof over one's head or views shelter exclusively as a commodity. Rather, it should be seen as the right to live somewhere in security, peace and dignity. So really quite big concepts associated with this. So adequate housing is about privacy, space, security, lighting, ventilation, and much more, not just a roof over a head. So the Economic and Social and Cultural Rights Committee has also expressly addressed forced evictions, which we see take place during genocide. And it recognized that many instances of forced eviction are associated with violence, such as evictions resulting from international armed conflict, internal strife, and communal or ethnic violence. They found that the practice of forced evictions may also result in violation of civil and political rights, such as the right to life, the right to security of the person, the right to non-interference with privacy, family and home, and the right to the peaceful enjoyment of possessions. So again, they're also pointing out the connection between different types of rights. And historically, property ownership has been connected with social citizenship, civic virtue, and the potential for political participation of individuals. Where the propertyless are marginalized and excluded with a lower social status. So that's what we see essentially happening in the genocide process when housing is taken away from the targeted group. Now, the images that I've got there, so I'm starting with the Armenian genocide. Um, what happened in the Armenian genocide was that uh, Armenians were pushed out of their villages and men and boys generally were killed. But the women and children were sent on death marches or they went on marches to escape the violence. And so the Armenian genocide happened in what is today Eastern Turkey and the escape marches that they did, the escape routes were to the east to what is into today's Armenia, modern day Armenia. But <laughs> the death marches went south down into the Mesopotamian desert of what is today Syria. So you can imagine what it must have been like and what the conditions were like, because when they were on death marches and also on the escape routes, they didn't have any shelter. And the images that you can see here, most of them come from the camps. And so they were put in camps, concentration camps in the desert, and they were lucky if they had tents. So in these images, one image you can see tents, but in another one, you can just see people lying on the ground in the desert. So no, no shelter or even barely any shelter in the Mesopotamian desert. You can imagine how hot that was and the exposure that they had. There's no evidence of any sanitation facilities provided in the camps. And German diplomat Wilhelm Litten remarked that the Meskene camp, when he saw it in February 1916, had no latrines and there was a broad belt of human excrement and refuse around the town and the campsite and described the stench of excrement as unbearable. So cleanliness, when you were living like this, was impossible. Um, guards would also throw blankets, beds, and clothing into the mud in the rainy season, so everything would get dirty on purpose. Um, Yeranuhi Simonian described the evacuation and his subsequent time in Karlik camp as including being deprived of water and soap for months. Now, these camps were not small camps. They held thousands of people. For example, Bab camp held over 100,000 people. So they were living in conditions where essentially maybe they had a tent or maybe not, but they had nothing else. They had no running water. They had no access to clean clothing and no shelter. So it's no surprise, of course, that thousands of people died in these conditions. So we're talking about adequate you know, adequate housing under this adequate standard of living, but actually what it can result in is actually the deaths of many people to not have adequate housing. And I talk about sanitation with this as well, because it, it's, it's quite connected with this idea of adequate housing, but also the right to health. The Holocaust has a lot of different um, and very interesting examples when we're talking about housing. So to start with, um, I, I'll start with the ghettos, which was the first 
place where Jews were moved. Although I do want to say they had restrictions um, in, in their lives before they moved to the ghettos. But in terms of thinking about housing, so in the ghettos, Jews were crowded into dilapidated apartments and they would have multiple families living in one apartment. There was obviously no room for comfort and no room for privacy. So there we think about the right to privacy. So for example, in the Wuch ghetto in September, 1941, 144,000 people were living in only 25,000 rooms. And the sanitation infrastructure that they had was unable to cope with such an excessive number of people in a small space. So garbage and human waste accumulated in communal receptacles that they had inside and also in courtyards of the buildings and it just overflowed and went uncollected. In the Wuch ghetto, there were over 31,000 apartments, but only 294 of those had inside toilets and only 613 had running water. So imagine that 144,000 people um, with barely any running water or infrastructure. In addition to that, winter, of course, in Poland brought freezing temperatures with minimal coal was provided to the ghetto inhabitants by the Nazis. No wood was provided, so uh, ghetto inhabitants would source wood elsewhere. They would dismantle fences, um, old buildings. They would rip up floorboards. They would burn furniture um, and even the walls in the apartments where they were living. Uh, children and adults actually froze to death in their homes um, and patients that were in hospitals in the ghettos where they had them also froze to death. Ghettos could have no electricity, no water, um, in the Wuch ghetto in January 1941, 1,218 people died and most of those were from starvation and cold. Conversely though, heat was also an issue. Um, in June 1944, when the Wuch ghetto was liquidated, survivor Eva Lubitsky and her family went into hiding in two attics in the ghetto. And so they were trying to avoid being deported to the camps. The attics had no furniture, as you can imagine, there were attics, um, so they used clothing as bedding and cushions, and Eva recalls the unbearable heat in the attics, and she said the space became a kind of oven and water was insufficient. So they would sneak out at night and they would empty the waste bucket that they had, and they would fill another bucket with water so that they had some water, but every time they did that, they risked getting caught. But after several weeks, they were so hungry and thirsty and a heat wave arrived and it just became unbearable. And she said, she called it the furnace and the family in the end had to leave. Um, the heat just drove them out and they were then arrested and sent to Auschwitz. And Eva was the only one who survived. Another form of housing, which I guess we don't think about as much, but is hiding. So many Jews had hid, but in so many different ways. Um, and actually, I, I attended a, a workshop uh, last year where someone was talking about uh, two brothers hiding inside a tree. They climbed up the tree and they had put steps inside the tree. And there also people would hide in places like caves and sewers and all sorts of places. So you know, um, the example image I have here is, is the Anne Frank house in Amsterdam, but in, in fact, that's almost luxurious compared to some of the circumstances that, that others found themselves in in hiding. Um, this is a screenshot. You can actually go onto the website and do a virtual tour of the Anne Frank house. Um, but obviously, you know, even though they were living in, in a housing space, they had those issues uh, of, of being quite a number of people that were in a, a small space there and, and having to be aware of their behaviour and what they did and trying not to get caught. Obviously, we also have in the Holocaust, uh, the concentration and the death camps. Um, so these became uh, incredibly crowded. They were either wooden or brick built barracks and they were filled with bunks that were overcrowded, um, more people than would fit in these rooms. Uh, for example, towards the end of its time, Dachau became so overcrowded with 63,000 prisoners 
that the rooms that were designed for 40 people had 450 people in them. Um, and the bunks were just crammed in and shared by hundreds of people. At Auschwitz, one block contained 234 beds with 702 mattresses, but held 1,193 prisoners. And the mattresses, which were made usually of straw or wood shavings, um, and the bedding was, was all unclean and it was all full of lice. Heating was limited if they had it at all. Um, usually they might have one or two iron wood fire stoves in the middle of the barracks. Um, and, and so you were lucky if you were located nearby that, but further away, obviously not warm. Um, they had no sanitation provisions in the barracks um, and were restricted as to their ability to leave the barracks and go and use the bathrooms, which was very difficult. Like a lot of survivors talking about um, the challenges because of course they were often very ill and had dysentery, they had diarrhea. And so not being able to use the bathroom was very difficult. Um, of course, they also, there was no cooling provided in summer. So we're talking about, you know, thousands of hundreds or thousands of people crowded into this. So when thinking about adequate, adequate housing, they had a roof over their head, but it wasn't adequate housing and it contributed significantly to issues of health and of course, even death. A little bit about sanitation. Uh, this was provided in the form of shared latrines. So usually it was generally just a long bench with holes cut in it um, or a row of toilet bowls, as you can see in the image there from Dachau, um, but they didn't have systems, they didn't have lids or anything like that. Um, in Treblinka, they had a two minute time limit put on toilet use and they actually, um, visits to the toilet were overseen by what they called a Scheißmeister, which was a shit master. And they would dress them up in rabbi's clothes. So again, this concept of humiliation um, involved. And they were given an alarm clock and a whip uh, to drive out people who overstayed their limit in the toilet. They did have some washing facilities, uh, such as large sinks um, or showers, which you can see in some of the images here as well. Um, but of course, proper showers were a rarity. Um, the permitted time to use the washrooms was minimal. Um, and of course, washrooms were shared amongst thousands of prisoners. Running water wasn't always a guarantee either in the camps, um, particularly because of the ongoing war and the consequent difficulty of accessing resources more generally. Um, in some cases, the camps had actually been established for quite some time before proper sanitation uh, facilities were installed. So in the meantime, thousands of detainees were left using things like wells and field latrines. The consequence of this, of course, was that vermin such as lice and rats were rampant in the camps, which of course then led to many of the diseases like typhus, typhoid, dysentery, and so on in the camps. Um, this is Cambodia. So in Cambodia, people were made to live a communal and rural life in shared living quarters, um, with the exception of the couples who were forcibly married by the Khmer Rouge regime. And they were permitted regularly to live alone together in a house, not all the time, but they were given times when they were put together in a house. Rowan Sam, who was 14 years old in 1975, he recall, oh, sorry, she recalls sleeping in one location with other children on the ground with no roof, wall or bed. In another, she said they slept with no walls. They did have a roof, but they slept on rice hay with stinky stained and threadbare rice seed bags for blankets. And she actually said a dog house was better than where we were staying. She said rats were nibbling her toenails and someone later stole her rice bag blanket, so she had nothing at all. Sanitation was also problematic uh, due to the lack of food and nutrition because essentially the Khmer Rouge starved their own people. Um, they made them, the, the forced labour was, a lot of the forced labour was growing rice, but they didn't actually allow the people to eat it. Um, so because of this, many people suffered from diarrhoea um, but they were, of course, too afraid to ask for a reprieve from work because they would be punished if that happened. And so they would soil themselves while working. Um, conditions in the prisons when, pe when people were put into prisons were specifically aimed at deprivation. So they would chain, they would 
put people together. So you can see in the images in the top right corner, this is where people would be forced to lie down. So there would be a whole row of these um, chains where they would lock their ankles into and they would have to lie down in those. So you can see on the left side, there's a painting that depicts what it was like with everyone changed to this same thing. So they were chained together. They had to sleep on the floor. They were rarely given food, no water, um, and, and obviously shackled together at night. No sanitation. They had a single pot maybe available to everyone in the in the tent, uh, in the hut, sorry. So obviously you can imagine the condition of the hut that they were living in. Um, so this is a painting by Van Natz, who was um, a survivor. Um, and there's a few, there were a few artists that survived and, and painted what they had experienced and seen. Um, the, the Van Nath painting here that you can see of the, the shower, the prisoners getting a shower, um, they did say that maybe that happened once or twice a week, if you were lucky, but more like once every few months. This is the refugee stage. So this is why I also think that this is part of it. So these are photographs taken in the refugee camps in Bangladesh. And you can see the conditions that they're living in. They're living in tarpaulin and bamboo huts. They have streams of waste running right behind where they're living. Um, and the toilet facilities can be quite mediocre. In the older uh, parts of the camps that are more established, they do have better conditions, but that has taken years to establish. Um, I did even actually use a flushing toilet in, in one. But once you start getting to the more recently established camps, the conditions are not good. But one of the main problems that we've seen in the past probably three years or so is fires have been ripping through these camps. And because it's just tarpaulin and bamboo, once a fire starts, it just takes out thousands of their shelters. And the shelters simply have a dirt floor and they have a wooden, a raised wooden platform as a bed um, and they have maybe a plastic chair um, and that's about it. That's their whole shelter essentially. So you can see then that they don't have adequate housing as refugees. Um, so that's partly why I'm arguing it's part of the process. I'm just gonna check my time and see how I'm doing. 10, 10, 10 15, all right, yeah. So I'm gonna go through clothing, but I'll, I'll do it. I'll see if we can get through it. Clothing I think is really interesting. So the right to adequate clothing is connected to other rights, including the right to life, because without adequate clothing, people can die from exposure to cold or heat temperatures. Um, removal of clothing, though, is also considered a form of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. So, for example, when victims are forced to strip, particularly in public, such coercive denials of the right to adequate clothing are actually radically disempowering and degrading. Clothing is also connected to the right to non-discrimination. So when people wear clothing which is culturally distinctive or a visual representation of their religious, political or other cultural affiliation, and the wearer is then targeted or discriminated against for their identity as represented by their clothing. So clothing or lack thereof can be used to stereotype and dehumanise a vulnerable minority group. And obviously on the slide there, I've given you one of the most extreme examples of that where people's clothing is obviously marked by a yellow star to identify them as Jewish. Um, so the impact of denial of clothing or denial of adequate clothing is aggravated for any person in a situation of deprivation of liberty because they have diminished control over their body and actions, um, which many people in the genocide process do. And for anyone who is out without adequate housing, it's also quite bad because obviously they're already exposed to the weather. So with the example of the Holocaust, now I've done these in a slightly different order for a particular reason, um, which you'll see momentarily. So normally I, I go historically and I talk about Armenia first, but Armenia and clothing is a very different example to the other two. So I talk about the Holocaust and Cambodia together. Um, 
the images that I've used are, I'm sure, really recognisable to you and it's probably one of the most recognisable pieces of clothing in the world, which is the so-called striped pyjamas that some prisoners were made to wear in camps during the Holocaust. I do want to make clear that not all camp prisoners wore these. Um, in some camps, prisoners were brought in. And so when, when Jews arrived in the camps or other prisoners arrived in the camps, all their clothing was taken away from them and put into storage. But then they were just given any kind of clothes that were available. So, I mean, there are ridiculous stories of people wearing evening dresses in the camps because that's the one item of clothing they were given, you know, an evening dress with a beautiful big bow. Um, and, and people were forced to wear clothing that didn't fit them. So something that was too small or pants that were enormous. So, for example, someone... Uh, one, one survivor said that a belt was one of the most sought after items because as you lost weight, you could continue to hold your pants up with the belt as your pants no longer fit you anymore. Or if you were given a giant pair of pants to begin with, the belt would hold them on because, of course, everybody needed to have some clothing and hang on to that. Um, underwear is something that I guess we probably don't think of all the time, even though we put it on every day. Um, prisoners' underwear was rarely changed if they had any at all, which they may not have. Um, so usually once, uh, only about once every few weeks. Um, facilities or water to wash clothing with was, was either minimal or just non-existent. So they were never got to, to clean their clothes. Um, one survivor noted camp conditions meant that prisoners' clothes became torn, dirty, louse infested, often stained with excrement and urine, smelly and repugnant. So imagine being stuck wearing that all the time and you could never clean it. And of course, again, I connect this with the right to health because this led to people being quite unwell um, and, you know, lice and the spread of diseases and this kinds of thing. Uh, this, um, some of the artefacts that you find, are, you know, really quite striking. And this one, Yvonne Koch, who was, uh, in Bergen-Belsen camp at age 11. She, these were her mittens and she still had them. And she talks about the woman who knitted these gloves or mittens for her um, with different threads that she had found. But you see the quote from her, how she talks about them. I always wore them, always had them on my hands. They always warmed me. And I always thought of this woman. I have such a strong memory of her because she was the first person to be good to me just for knitting her a pair of gloves. And that shows you how important clothing is, but the meaning behind it as well, and her connection with this woman who she didn't know what happened to her, but she always remembered her because she'd, she'd helped Yvonne stay warm, which was so important. So we looked at the striped pajamas. In Cambodia, they had black pajamas. So it's actually really, really interesting, the similarities here. Um, so these are perhaps less well known, but they are also termed pajamas. And so this is the black pants, shirt, and cap that the Khmer Rouge made everyone wear, which was paired with a red and white scarf. So this was part of collectivization that the Khmer Rouge sought. So collectivization also included collectivization of clothing. It was also accompanied by a standard bowl haircut for everyone to comply with communist ideology that everyone is the same. There are no class differences and no differences between anyone. Nobody was allowed to wear any individual items of clothing. Um, even monks were disrobed. That was part of uh, the targeting of, of the Buddhist religion. So only the Khmer Rouge soldiers and cadres were permitted to wear a variation, which was khaki. So it's the color you can see on the right-hand side. So it's the same though, it was the same outfit, but it was just in khaki. Um, Ruin Sam recalls being forced to wear um, bloodstained clothes of one of her friends who had been taken away and obviously assumed to be killed. And so the clothing that she was left with was that of her friends. Um, the image that I've got there um, on the left-hand side of the screen is uh, textiles, so clothing, bags, hats from the Khmer Rouge time that are being preserved in the Tool Slang Museum 
in uh, Phnom Penh. So if you're ever there, it's really interesting. And I understand that they have recently opened an exhibition about the textiles because it's taken them a lot of work to preserve them. So the boxes there, you can see they have little holes on them. They're temperature controlled. So because it's so humid in Cambodia, that it's um, a lot of work to try and preserve this because it's such a piece of the history there. Um, I'm wary of running out of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip talking about shoes, which are also really important. And, but I'm going to just finish up with explaining clothing and the Armenian genocide. Um, it was very, very different. So those two genocides that we've just seen, clothing was about identification and being identified as who you are, whichever way that may be. But in the Armenian genocide, it was about removal of clothing. So they would come into the villages, they would often strip people um, just in, in public in the street um, in, in the initial days. And then when it escalated, they would also do that before they would um, torture and or kill people. The women and the children who were walked on the death marches were stripped sometimes to nothing. Sometimes they were you know, in bare minimal kind of underwear, but essentially, you know, they ended up, and when they were in the camps, they just had no access to clothing. They, they had access to nothing. Any clothing that they did have became quite filthy and it became infested with fleas. Uh, they could only get clean clothing if they were able to bribe the guards. But of course, where did they get money from to do that? So um, it is really quite, Clothing is still relevant, but in a very, very different way to the other genocides, which I found quite interesting. Um, so obviously this contributed to the exposure that they experienced um, in the extreme heat in the desert um, and, and obviously the death of a lot of them. So basically uh, human rights violations, I find are an essential part of the genocide process. Um, the violations that I've mentioned of the right to adequate standard of living, so housing and clothing, they amount to the genocide crime of deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, as well as causing serious bodily or mental harm. But they may also amount to contribute to killing um, because obviously leading to exposure, people get ill and they die. So all of these violations um, of the right to adequate standard of living uh, contribute to a violation of the right to health, increasing the likelihood of death, which is therefore violating the right to life, uh, or sometimes resulting in lifelong in injuries or illness that survivors carry with them throughout their whole life. Um, so for example, stomach, um, just in inability to eat um, normally anymore. And the violations of the rights to health and adequate standard of living are actually really key components of the genocide process, and they contribute substantially to the destruction of the victim group. So I think that all stages of the genocide process should be recognized in genocide prosecutions and judgments and not just the killing. There are commonalities throughout the case studies that I looked at across genocides um, with regards to the process of this crime of genocide. And I think, and what I hope is that my book provides a map for prosecutors and judges to recognize all of these stages through prosecuting and convicting the full range of genocide crimes, including by demonstrating how all the human rights violations in the genocide process are interconnected and therefore an essential part of the genocide process. Thank you.